Here we see a charming, if somewhat sleepy young lady demonstrating her enjoyment of a spring morning. And although I cannot freeze her position, you will notice if you look that she from time to time adopts that posture recommended by Sir Ivan McGill as ideal for blind nasal intubation. Here is our elderly hero. Whoops a daisy. And here, in roughly the same position, we see a real patient already asleep. And three minutes later, the surgeons having asked for a tube down the left nostril, I won't get that out. Traditionally, blind nasal intubation is performed, or was performed, by putting the patient to sleep and then ventilating him or allowing him to breathe a mixture of nitrous oxide, in this case five liters, oxygen, two liters per minute, and carbon dioxide, which here you will see running at one liter per minute. And this was continued until he was hyperventilating and although probably lightly anaesthetized, this was used as a method really to cheat a tube into a patient who frequently would not have tolerated its passage without this adjunct. And if all goes well, the tube will go down the first time. And the sign that it is done so in those days was all too frequently a coughing and bucking, because the patient, it must be remembered, was not deeply <laughs> anaesthetized. Since the introduction of relaxant agents, we have not used this technique at this hospital at any rate. And we perform our nasal intubations on patients who are paralyzed and apneic. This is a very much, we feel, gentler procedure. And the lack of reaction on the part of the patient is quite obviously much less traumatic. And that is it. Mm -hmm. With the head extended firmly, turned slightly to the right, we will put the tube down with the tip inclined slightly to the left and we have gone into the larynx. This is what 80% of the time should happen. How then, if the patient is not breathing and does not cough, are you to know that the tube is in the right place? Firstly, frequently by the feel of things you know you are in, and with experience are rarely wrong. You may remember that in one shot you heard me say, and that is in. Secondly, the point of the tube may run down the rings of the trachea in a manner that reminds one of rattling a stick along the railings as a child. Thirdly, if not wholly paralyzed, there may be small rhythmic movements of the pharynx, as though the patient were trying to cough but were really unable to. Fourthly, compression of the chest while listening to the end of the tube produces a synchronous puff of air which is audible. And fifthly, ventilation produces an obvious expansion of the chest. Lastly, and finally, in the obese or barrel-chested, none of the above signs may be easily elicited, and you may have to look to verify that your tube is, in fact, in the larynx. How then are we to know that the tube is not in the trachea? 
Well, in the first place, it may feel wrong. We just know that we haven't gone the right way. Secondly, on compressing the chest, one may hear an oily esophageal click rather than the huff-huff of expressed air. And thirdly, on ventilation, we are greeted with a belch rather than the movement. If the tube is arrested gently and then goes into the esophagus, we may see the end of the tube impinge on one side or other of the pharynx. Centre the distal end of the tube by rotating the proximal end and if now seen to impinge on the other side of the pharynx, you have overcorrected. Try and centre it and this will often be successful. Here we see this shown on the right side. And here is the diagram showing us what has happened. The tube has pressed against the pharyngeal wall and you will see a bulge where the black arrow is pointing. Withdraw the tube a little and rotate it. Here it is on the left side and the diagram again shows us that we have overcorrected. We've gone from the right side to the left. Withdraw the tube. We've established a bracket. Down we go and the diagram agrees with us. And to the right side. I rotate the tube and it goes over to the left but misses. I steady it in the middle and it goes down the trachea. If you are unable to center the distal end of the tube, and this is sometimes impossible to do, then you may rotate the head, move the larynx to the appropriate side towards where you see the end of the tube, and this is indicated by the arrows, press the pharynx above the larynx to influence the end of the tube, combine the above two procedures, which I indicate by that little diagram, and in the end, maybe you will be forced if nothing works, to laryngoscope the patient. Should the tube have, have been arrested there and should it have been uh, difficult to rotate it, one may attempt to move it over by withdrawing it a little and pressing the tube over towards the laryngeal orifice. And will it go down when you do that? Like that. Oh, very good. Or, should the tube again stay there, then it may be possible to move the larynx to below the end of the tube and again. If the tube is almost centered but is arrested with a feeling of elasticity, it is probably on an arytenoid cartilage. On the other hand, if the tube is solidly arrested, it is through the cords and held up by the anterior ring of the cricoid cartilage. In young patients, a further extension of the head will cause its passage, but in the more elderly you may have to rotate the tube through 360 degrees, flex the head, or, as a last resort, press on the cricoid cartilage. This is not recommended. In the conscious patient, it is very painful, and I cannot but believe that it is traumatic. Here we see the larynx of a cadaver on which the thyroid cartilage has been dissected as a flap which pulled down reveals the arytenoid cartilage, the false cord, the sinus or ventricle of the larynx, the true vocal cord, the part of the thyroid cartilage below the cords and here the anterior ring of the cricoid. Here you can see coming into view an endotracheal tube on which I have cut a bevel in the opposite direction to that which we customarily use and I think that one of the causes of the arrest of a tube which I have talked about is when that bevel engages, and I'm sorry that I'm having to do it artificially here, the arytenoid cartilage. Here is a tube with a bevel cut in the conventional direction, remembering that we are looking from the left side, and I am driven to wonder recently whether perhaps another cause of obstruction may not be that it enters 
the ventricle of the larynx in this manner remembering that the vocal cord which has to be passed medially is here both of these forms of obstruction on the arytenoid or possibly in the ventricle are those which we pass with luck by rotating the tube or by manipulating the larynx from side to side should the cords be successfully passed we may yet suffer one further firm and definite obstruction and that and I will have to manipulate the end of my tube is when it becomes lodged in the cricothyroid membrane difficult to demonstrate but the arrest is by the anterior ring of the cricoid cartilage and it is this obstruction that we pass by rotating the tube or by as I have mentioned before flexing the head one final point is worth observing and that is how when the tube passes into the trachea it may be seen to run along the rings as I have previously mentioned this is one of the signs that your blind endotracheal intubation has been successful here we have obstruction at the cricoid level in a young man overcome by extending the head and straightening the respiratory tract this elderly man presents the same problem but we cannot extend his head and therefore the tube has to be passed by flexion and you will see it run down the front of his trachea to present a program on blind nasal intubation of the trachea without talking about the tubes that we use would be like a production of Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. If, in the interests of brevity, I sound dogmatic, I can only assure you that I am not. This is a tube which is sold as a nasal or nasotracheal tube. You will observe the long, sharp bevel and the very thin wall. I believe that this bevel is a danger as if the head is turned from side to side it is liable to impinge or occlude itself against the wall of the trachea and form a valve and its narrow wall makes it particularly prone to nipping in the nose. It has got me into trouble on a number of times and we never use it. Here is the McGill tube sold as an oral tube. The bevel is, as far as I'm concerned, ideal. The wall is slightly thicker, but not markedly so. And this is our standard tube for simple nasal intubation for dental or other minor head and neck surgery. The ideal bevel, of course, would be none at all. But we've tried this, and it is an extremely difficult tube to pass, and must therefore remain an ideal. Coming to cuff tubes, I have here an old faithful, the cuff McGill tube, with a pilot bulb, and this is our standard tube still. You will see, however, that it is when inflated somewhat less than ideal in that there is beyond the end of the cuff a projection of about an inch the last half inch of this tube is unnecessary and in practice it is trimmed off the end of the tube may be smoothed by holding it in a flame and rubbing it with some halothane on a swab and another factor to be borne in mind is that I have measured a considerable number of people on a marked tube
from the nearest to the vocal cords, and the smallest adult, a young lady, had a distance of 17 centimeters from the nose to the cords, and the longest distance I have yet found in a rather large man was 22 centimeters. Thus, from the beginning of the cuff, where it should lie below the cords, to the insertion of the angle piece should ideally, and for most people, be somewhere about 20, 19 and a half to 20 centimeters. This tube is long enough for a very large man, and on the average person, the bevel would be on the carina. We thus, to make it safe to use, must cut off a piece from the end. It is our practice not to have any of the tube projecting from the nostril and thus we have a snug fit and the patient may be toweled to the maximum convenience of the surgeon. There have been recently appearing on the market a variety of tubes with various types of cuff for which various claims are made and I am not conducting a witch guide or a witch hunt. And you must decide what characteristics you are looking for in a tube and which of those available satisfies you best. This tube I have used fairly frequently. It is very firm. It has a very reasonable bevel. The disadvantage is that it has a very short cuff and I would prefer one longer. It has another advantage in that its reinforcement goes only up to here, that one of these plastic end pieces may be put into it and it fits snugly onto the shoulder piece of an absorber without the intervention of one of the standard catheter mounts. It has, I believe, now been withdrawn from the market and supplanted by this, with which some of you, although you may not be able to see the colour clearly, may be familiar. It is an atrociously thick walled tube uh, and I have never been led to use it. There are a number of other tubes made by a number of companies who claim that their cuffs are softer than others that their walls are thinner than others and these claims may be right, I don't know but the tubes themselves tend to be stiff and one must remember that if a tube is to be passed blind one needs something of the life by that I mean the living quality that one has in a rubber tube to guide one and to aid one in passing it and these are not easy to pass and moreover, I think they are perhaps not very kind to the patient. These have an advantage over their previous models that they do not lose their character at body heat. I've soaked these in a bath at 98.4 degrees and they remain as good as when they start. But I personally, for routine use, still find I am best satisfied with that tube which we have had for the last 25 years. Nasotracheal intubation is always, as an airway, second best to orotracheal, but it is useful or obligatory. One, if surgery is made easier by the absence of a tube in the mouth. Two, if orotracheal intubation is so difficult that it would be too traumatic to attempt it or continue to attempt it. And remember that abdominal surgery in the old days was frequently done with either a cuffed nasotracheal tube or a tube under a mask. And thirdly, it is obligatory if the mouth will not open, either from trismus, congenital causes, trauma, ankylosis, or a number of other reasons. Its disadvantages are that the tube may be nipped in the nose and the airway may be less than you think it is and also remember that it is a technique which is not easy to acquire.